Well, as the emergency test siren going on at noon at the first day of the month across the street tells us, it's time to start History's Lunch. Thank you all for being with us on this glorious day in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. I am Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. MDAH holds the richest collection of Mississippi artifacts in the world, most of it on two sublevels of this building. If you are interested in George Orr pottery, Choctaw baskets, quilts, flags, historical swords and firearms, and much, much more, then our new behind the scenes tours are for you. There are spots open on today's hour-long tour that will begin at 1.30. Tickets are $25 or $20 if you are a museum member and may be purchased at the lobby desk. Again, there are a few slots left open. If you're interested, you can purchase those after History's Lunch in the lobby. And then at 6.30 on Friday, the Eudora Welty House and Garden will screen the documentary Bill Minor, Eyes on Mississippi. Producer-director Ellen Ann Ventress will be joined by Fred Anklum. Cleta Ellington and Joanne Pritchard Morris for a very subdued, if you know that group, discussion before the movie. And then on Thursday, May 9th at 6 p.m., the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum are partnering with New Stage Theater to present a free performance of If Not Us, Then Who? Freedom Rides to Freedom Summer in this space. The play, written and directed by Sharon Miles, features stories from well-known activists such as Fannie Lou Hamer and Congressman John Lewis, along with lesser-known heroes. Finally, I hope that you'll be able to join us next week for History is Lunch when our speakers will be Natalie Adams and Jim Adams discussing their new University Press of Mississippi book, Just Trying to Have School, The Struggle for Desegregation in Mississippi. You may remember that was originally scheduled for February and uh, the speakers came down with the flu. Uh, oh, and that week we had uh, David Ray Morris's film Yazoo Revisited in its place. We did not have DVDs for that for sale at the time, but those have arrived and they are in the store for those of you who had asked about it. Today, we are delighted to have Chuck Yarbrough and Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science students Darian Bowles, Kaylin McNeese, and Ezra McWilliams with us to present the 8th of May, Emancipation in Mississippi. Chuck Yarborough is a history instructor at the Mississippi School for Math and Science, where he also directs the Tales from the Crypt and 8th of May Emancipation Celebration Projects. In part for his role in developing those nationally recognized programs, Yarborough was named the Organization of American Historians 2019 Mary Kay Bonsteel Takao Teacher of the Year. He is a longtime friend of the department. These are great programs that we have watched with admiration for a long time. We're delighted to have them here with us today. Help me welcome Chuck Yarbrough. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for being here, uh, welcoming both me and my students. And, uh, and also, by the way, thank you to the people of the great state of Mississippi for creating this institution. I know in my childhood it was not so easy to research and explore and then honestly discuss the story of our state. Um, I am uh, very pleased to be here and have been involved with archives and history for a long time, even though uh, when I moved to Columbus, everybody in here knows who Elbert Hilliard is. Um, Elbert used to call meetings at 8 a.m. here in Jackson, and that was hard for us to drive from Columbus, Mississippi and not spend the night in a hotel, so we used to tease him that he must have thought the world was flat, and if you drove to Carthage, you would fall off, you know, but, but anyway, we're glad to be here, and it, we did not fall off on our way here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk some about the 8th of May emancipation in Columbus, Mississippi, in the surrounding area, and also talk about a research performance project that students in my classes and with our Voices in Harmony Choir have been engaged in developing and renewing each year since 2006. Um, I like to... Uh, remind everybody that when I present and when we talk about the emancipation story in East Mississippi, we're not talking about just black history. This is not just black history, African-American history. It's not the history of the 19th century. It is our history, and our history is our story. Slavery is an institution in the United States which touched everyone. It left a mark on every one and every institution, and that's a mark that we as a society and as a nation and as a state have got to address and honestly discuss. If we can't, if we 
you know, shrink away from addressing the challenges of our past, what we're really saying is that we're not willing to take the time to think about how to create our most productive and constructive future. So I just want to keep that theme in mind as we move forward today. Now, this is a photograph of early 20th century downtown Columbus. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that. But it's, it's useful because I like to think of this photograph as a way to begin to think about which stories have been told and which stories need to be told or are at least added to the story that has been told in our little community. Now, this is, uh, here we go, okay. This is Main Street, and this alley is commonly referred to in Columbus as Catfish Alley. That's 4th Street South, and the first 100 blocks south of Main Street, between College Street and Main, was a gathering place for African Americans from the county. It also was a business hub of people in Columbus in the African American community. In 1912, the city directories indicate that there were 18 businesses operating on that one block. 12 of them were owned and operated by African Americans. In uh, 1921, there was a woman named Carter who ran a restaurant at uh, 124, if I'm remembering the exact address, uh, 4 Street South in Catfish Alley. And nearly 100 years later, in 2018, there was a business Jones restaurant operating in the same location, also owned and operated by an African-American woman. So this is a big deal in Columbus as part of our story. But the story of Catfish Alley is not included anywhere in the official, quote-unquote, story or history of our community before the last 20 years or so. Um, now, this is a state historic marker. This particular marker was put up in the 1950s, and it marks the location of the Confederate arsenal, which was in Columbus. At this location here in 1862, Confederacy uh, built a huge arsenal employing over 1,000 persons. Later, one of the buildings became the original site of Union Academy, first free public school for Negroes in Columbus. All of the state historic markers in Columbus and Lowndes County, when I arrived, this is the only one that mentioned the African-American community in any way. Now, to me, this illustrates the need to think about completing the story, to offer the complexity and to research and explore that complexity. Uh, this is factually correct, but it doesn't tell uh, what was it, Paul, I forget his last name, the rest of the story. Remember, remember the rest of the story? Paul Harvey, thank you. Um, this is on Ninth Avenue South. The building that was at that location uh, is no longer there. It's actually the backyard of somebody's private residence, and it's been knocked over at least twice in the last 20 years by somebody recklessly driving in the neighborhood. I'm not sure if it's a, a bad driver magnet or if it's just not constructed very well. So my question was, how do we get to exploring this complexity in a way that's, um, you know, not accusatory, not, not that I think you, we, we can't accuse people in the past of making mistakes and doing things that are pretty horrible, but rather one that's constructive moving forward from this point. And the way um, I decided to do that is actually heavily dependent upon my late colleague and good friend and friend of history for the state of Mississippi that a lot of people in this room also know, maybe not as much as Albert Hilliard, but that was Carl Butler. Carl Butler was a legendary teacher and swim coach in Columbus, Mississippi, who developed the Tales from the Crypt program at the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science in 1991. He also owned an old home. He and his wife Dixie uh, owned Temple Heights, one of the Mississippi landmarks in Columbus. Carl had figured out that we could have a research project in a cemetery, and I'm proud to have taken that over and been directing it for the past 19 years but figured out that the cemetery was a great place. You know, I like to say that the burial ground is common ground. We're all going to end up there. I, I've just, in case you didn't realize it, young people, you're going to end up in a cemetery probably. The, um, but also, cemeteries represent the commonality of grief and loss. And, and every one of us knows what it's like to lose loved ones. Everyone, every human being understands what loss is like and the cemetery represents it. And every loss suggests 
a story, a life that has been lost. You know, as my old professor Bill Ferris, I just called him old, I guess, but former professor Bill Ferris used to quote the African proverb, proverb that each time a, an old man dies, a library burns to the ground. And it's true. You know, what we have these common experiences and we can understand them in this neutral ground, this, not the neutral ground in New Orleans that you climb up and park on in a flood, but rather the common ground of the burial ground. So, where's our common ground? In Columbus, for this project, our common ground is the Sandfield Cemetery. And uh, the Sandfield Cemetery was established in the 1840s. It was, uh, it was established as an African-American burial ground because there were people in Columbus who were not happy that African-Americans and whites were being buried in the same location. Um, it's also, by the way, just a few years after somebody tried to blow up the Episcopal Church because the church had built itself too close to the old cemetery, which is kind of interesting, don't you think? But anyway, um, historically African-American. It is identified in the early 20th century city directories as the uh, colored or Negro burial ground, whichever year you look at. The sexton is a guy named Willie Hunter. So it's established by that point as a significant location. And this is the place where the leaders in the time period we're going to talk about today are buried. People like Senator Robert Gleed, people like the Rabb family, people like the Mitchell family, and some folks I'll introduce you to shortly. This is a photograph of it. Um, I took a tour group there in 1998 for the uh, Mississippi Historic Preservation Conference uh, because my old friend Carl Butler kind of twisted my arm. I was the new young teacher. I was young at one point, by the way. And I had hair, but it wasn't in 1998. It was like in 1978. But anyway, the, uh, the, the deal is that the, uh, I was asked to take a tour out there. And, you know, this is the cemetery. It looks like it's empty. Uh, we believe this historic part of the cemetery is filled. And there are not tombstones because that represents the reality of the socioeconomic class and the reality of the people who are buried there. Uh, but the tombstones that are there can be pretty noteworthy and help us understand the story. Now, what about the date? Well, the date, uh, according to diarist uh, Cyrus Green, who you're going to hear from in just a minute, the 8th of May, 1865, is the day that Union troops arrived in Columbus. We know that it would be celebrated as the day to celebrate emancipation. Now, the celebration of emancipation is not a universal thing. Frederick Douglass and, and he, those guys, they celebrated as January 1st. That was Emancipation Day because that's the day the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. In other parts of the world, in Texas, of course, they celebrate Juneteenth. And Juneteenth is in June, for obviously, maybe, but, uh, but in June. So this is a regional event significant in a local community. And that's why we picked the date. Now, the other, you know, reality of picking this date is because in, 19, in 2006, a young lady whose name was Renita Holmes, I like to speak her name every time I tell the story. Renita was from Louisville. She was a high school junior. She was the head of our Voices in Harmony Choir. And Renita came to me because she knew I'd done a lot of local black history research and asked, Mr. Yarbrough, will you help us put together a Black History Month program? And I said, Renita, I would love to do that. The problem is, as I recall, it was either February 25th or February 26th. Now, that means Black History Month is over in 48 hours. And there's not going to be a program put together in that amount of time. So we talked. And I said, look, you know, it's too late to do Black History Month with any respect for what you're trying to present. But how about you think about the 8th of May? And I told her the story that I knew, and I told her of the place, Sandfield Cemetery, and the possibility of developing a performance program in the cemetery, because Renita had been one of my Tales from the Crypt performers that previous year. So that's why we ended up in this place. Now, in effect, the 8th of May is significant, too. You know, the word emancipation is kind of problematic, right? I mean, for a long time, and I know when I was taught emancipation, emancipation happened, slavery was over. Well, we know better. You know, the reality is legal slavery, of course, was outlawed by the 13th Amendment. And when, when Union troops arrived, then there was the possibility, the hope, not even the expectation, the hope of emancipation, freedom, and equality. And that's what that date meant in 1865 for African-Americans in Columbus and Lowndes County. 
And Lowndes County was majority African American at that point. Mississippi was majority African American. The vast majority of Mississippi and African Americans were enslaved. There were only in 1860 about 400 free men or women of color in the entire state. Over 235,000 enslaved people. So we're talking about the common experiences in enslavement. And like I said, it made a mark on everyone, um, black and white. So in any case, th this is the idea. A year after, on May 8, 1866, we know, as you're about to hear, that there was a celebration to celebrate the first year anniversary. We also know that in the early 20th century, that the newspapers in Columbus are reporting for years, for many years, I'm quoting, that uh, emancipation had been celebrated by the black community with parades, with ball games, with speeches, with food, with dance, with music. And, uh, and visitors are reported coming from Memphis and from Birmingham and from other cities like Tupelo, you know, not too, too far away. And, of course, in Columbus, people would say, well, Tupelo is not a city, you know, a little rivalry there. But anyway, the, uh, you know, people are coming from not just in Lowndes County. It's not solely a local uh, event. Um, this is an example. This is an excerpt from the, uh, well, it is the story from May 10th, 1906. Tuesday was the 8th of May, and the day as usual celebrated by the colored people of Columbus. The members of the various colored fraternal and benevolent organizations of the city assembled at the Fisherman's Building on Main Street and, forming a procession, marched to the old fairgrounds on Military Road. The address at the fairgrounds was delivered by Reverend W.H. Edmonds, pastor of the Colored Methodist Church, and at its conclusion, the crowd devoted itself to various amusements and diversions. There were baseball games, shooting matches, and other similar sports, and the afternoon was pleasantly spent by the large number of colored people who were present. So in 1906, this would be the 50th anniversary of that initial 8th of May celebration. Um, this is uh, in 1913, and I like this one because I've had people say, now wait a second, was this event really a thing? Was this really what you're suggesting it was? Are you kind of trying to, you know, are you trying to ride the coattails of Juneteenth and the Convention of Visitors Bureau wants you to do this so we can get a bunch of tourists to come to Columbus and that kind of stuff, which is not the case. I, I'm, I, I would love that to happen, but that's not really the point. The point is to have students engage in the community somehow. But the, uh, the Emancipation Day is reported here, and then up at the top right, when I arrived in Columbus, the 8th of May had ceased to be celebrated in the black community with the exception of one rural church out near Crawford in Lowndes County where men met and still beat the drums throughout the day. From dawn till dusk, they beat a drum in the churchyard. And, um, but the Episcopal Church ladies held the 8th of May luncheon, which was a fundraiser. And the fundraiser fund a lot of the good deeds they do in the community. And this is in 1913. It's reported that St. Paul's Episcopal Church will serve luncheon for the benefit of householders who give their servants a holiday. So the 8th of May is recognized in the white community as a significant day of celebration and um, time off. So now I've said several times research and performance project. And at this point, I've suggested some of the type of research students have uncovered and I've done. But you've seen nothing but me walk around on the stage essentially trying to stay out of the light because the reflection off my scalp might be overwhelming to you. But, um, but I'd like to now call up one of the students who was a performer in our 8th of May program last year. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him after he does his thing. So I'd like you to welcome Kalen McNeese, who is from um, Pearl, right? Pearl, Mississippi. Come on down, Kalen. Good afternoon. My name is Cyrus Green, and I'm a Quaker from Indiana who came down to Columbus, Mississippi early in 1866 to teach with the Freedmen's Bureau. I kept a diary, and as we begin our celebration today, I would like to share with you all some of what impressed me about the freedmen and freedwomen I had seen. I did not fully realize the violence I would see, nor the courage I had witnessed in response to it. On February 12, 1866, I wrote of threatened horrors. Night school tonight. 
We heard a hint this evening that there was talk among the Southern chivalry and Yankee haters of setting fire to the Wayside Hospital and thus put an end to our work there. I hope there is no danger, yet it may be so. The ex-Confederates didn't stop with the rumor, though. We received a letter threatening death if we continued educating the freed people. And I remember the strength and resolve my African-American friends had shown in the face of this threatened danger. We went to the residence of John Robert Gleed, one of the leading colored men here and our special friend. They, the colored guard, after the meeting when about 90 were present, armed as they had means, and they stationed guards at the corners and at the schoolhouse. A heavy guard slept in the hall of our house while one or two trod their beat before the door. I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised that these men were willing to fight for their rights. After all, in every American war, African Americans have served valiantly for our country. In fact, according to the National Archives, eight black Union soldiers were buried in Sandfield Cemetery. Later in 1867, they were disinterred and moved to Corinth National Cemetery, and around the same time, 32 white Union soldiers were moved from Friendship Cemetery in Columbus, Mississippi, to Corinth. And in the face of these dangers and in the wake of a race massacre that had happened a few days prior in Memphis, Tennessee, the local freed people on May 8, 1866, instituted the celebration we are all commemorating today. And as I recorded on my diary on May 8th, 1865, federal troops had marched into Columbus and had liberated the slaves from their masters. And the next year, those freed people had thrown a party. And this is what I recorded in my diary about the first historic 8th of May celebration. May 8th, 1866. Today was a day long to be remembered by many of the African race here. It was their first celebration and commemoration of their freedom. One year ago this morning, the federal troops arrived in this place and had proclaimed the slaves free. And Robert Gleed spoke some very much to the point. But the grand display and crowning success of the day was the May party at night and the home, and the, and the, excuse me, in the supper. And I will only say here that it was a splendid success. Little, I presume, would our friends at home dream that this people could bring a company of their own so well and tastefully dressed to witness the coronation of their May Queen and to listen to the speeches and replies of the occasion. The supper table was covered not only with the widest linen, but an enigmatic profusion of cakes, meats, candies, and was blended tastefully with flowers, leaves, and every conceivable beauty culled from nature's great laboratory. To crown all, Everything passed off smoothly. And although there was rain falling profusely outside, the performers, the performers were often cheered by loud claps of thunder as though the heavens too were in ecstasy. There was, a, there was a rain of joy in each heart, which beamed out through every face as pleasantly as the smile of a bride. And today, we continue the celebration they began. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So our performance each year is a musical and dramatic presentation of research done by students and or myself and writing by the students. The Cyrus Green diary excerpts are, are contained in a typescript of the original diary, which are, the original is in Illinois. The typescript is in the Columbus Lowndes County Library Archives. Kalen was a Tales from the Crypt performer, which is what this photograph is from. His Tales character had really dark eyes. Okay, so, so anyway, um, Kalen, we start the performance off after an introduction by me, much more brief than this one has been, and Kalen does his thing. Then our Voices in Harmony Choir will lead songs that speak to the African American experience. Now, Kalen mentioned a threatening letter to the Freedmen's Bureau School workers. We know about this because it's in the Columbus Council City Minutes. Here's the transcript of it. It was received on April 19, 1866, and uh, it says, Dr. Wilson, 
we the undersigned have determined that you shall not stay in this country and teach a Negro school. And if you do not leave, we will hang you and your whole crowd. Do as you please, leave or not. That is one thing we are determined on that you that you not stay if you can forever a people that will hold you leave immediately your many enemies is what it's saying now grammatically it's problematic down here at the bottom the english teachers in the group but but this is the environment in which that initial celebration took place just a few days after this a few days before that 8th of may in memphis tennessee there was a race riot which resulted in at least 46 uh, African-American people killed. Now, but Cyrus Green is not buried in Sandfield Cemetery. There were people at that first meeting who are, and one of them is Jack Rabb. Jack Rabb, over here on the left, died in September of 1882. His wife, Gilly, is buried with him in a, what we call the double-wide marker. It's way off on the side of the cemetery, and people say, where's he buried? Over there, the double-wide marker, and everybody goes right to it, so that's why I call that up. In any case, I'd like to invite up now Mr. Ezra McWilliams from Ruleville, Mississippi. Fresh meat, poultry, game, country produce of all kinds. Get it right here at Rab's Meat Market, owner Alan Rab. Well, that's what you could have said until my store closed during the Great Depression. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Rabb, and I was born in 1866, right over yonder in Columbus, and I became the owner of my very own meat market, Rabb's Meat Market. I mean, honestly, I feel like my story is the ultimate American success story. You see, I am the son of a man and a woman who were enslaved, but my father bought his own freedom before the Civil War. I am one of six children, and in my humble opinion, I am the most successful, because I own my own meat market. <laughs> During the prime of my meat market, discrimination towards African Americans like myself was at an all-time high. It became so bad that some of us decide to move up north. Sounds familiar? You might have think I would have done the same, but I knew I couldn't leave my family behind or my meat market behind. So I worked hard and stayed in school and became the owner of my meat market. Originally, my meat market was on Market Street. It's that block between the courthouse and Main Street, but eventually it moved to 9th Street and 5th Avenue South. Then the thought had occurred to me, wouldn't it be great if I could just get closer to my meat market? So I built my house right next to it in the latest style of that day, Queen Anne's. But my meat market and my house were both torn down in the 1960s because MUW needed to build faculty housing. Hey, did you want it oysters? You over there, did you want sauce? Well, consider it done. Originally, as I aforementioned, business became natural to me. My father, Jack Rabb, was born in 1830 and he was a retail grocer. He owned a garden that went by both Temperance Garden and Rab's Garden. In fact, if you go where the old barrel building at, you'll find it would be right there. But before all that, he was in slavery by a man named Alexander J. Rab. And he bought his own slave, he bought his own freedom, and my aunts as well. And some people didn't even believe it, but the Lowndes County Courthouse showed that he was a free man by 1862. Being in slavery motivated my father to see the importance of an education. So he urged all his children to work hard, and worked hard we did. But of course, I would be remiss if I forgot about my brother Simon. See, my brother Simon was five years my junior, and there, as I would say, 
he was almost as successful as me. He was a waiter in a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. But he died and was buried in Columbus in 1914, just like yours truly. But as I continued to work on my meat market, discrimination was still piled up against me. It became so bad that prejudice created a system to oppress us and keep us from taking a more active role in society. In 1890, the Mississippi Constitution passed literacy tests that target people like myself that were inadequately educated. But despite all the obstacles, I wanted to rise above it. So I motivated my children to do the same. One of my children in particular named Lewis, and boy, I am so proud of that boy. He earned one bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, and continued advancing to work at Tuskegee University and John Andrew Hospital. He lived to the age of 101 and died in 2015 to join the rest of his family. Over a century after Ralph's meat market, our great-great-grandchildren are still benefiting off the success and continue to make their own. But at some point in your lives, if you're just in need of some dire inspiration, come on down to 9th Street Avenue and 9th Street, 9th Street and 5th Avenue South. My store may be gone, but the rap legacy still lives on. But in the meantime, just ask yourselves, what can I do today? How can I use my life to inspire true success? Thank you, Ezra. Now, this is a photograph of Alan Rabb, sent to me by one of his great-grandsons. Alan Rabb, uh, this is at the door of his meat market. This is the meat market, which uh, for any of you who have been to Columbus, this would be the corner of faculty housing. And the Barrows School, which is an elementary school, would be in this block over here. It's now the MUW physical plant. This was uh, Alan Rabb's Queen Anne house. Now, the Rabb family, his children left Columbus. He mentioned a uh, younger brother, Lewis. Lewis had a son named Maurice, and Maurice became a physician as well and was the first African-American man to perform a heart transplant in the state of Kentucky. Um, next, we're going to hear from Darian Bowles. <laughs> Darian is from Bahalia. Good afternoon, good people of Mississippi. Although my experience ought to have taught me that the people of Mississippi aren't always so good, at least not where myself and my people are concerned. Now, I suspect most of you may know me. I'm Mississippi State Senator Robert Gleed, a notable business owner and political leader in Columbus and Lowndes County after freedom came in 1865. In fact, I was the organizer and featured speaker at the very first Ace of May celebration in 1866. Now, of course, I wasn't always so distinguished and powerful. Like the vast majority of my people, I was enslaved before and during the Civil War. At the age of 17, I was living in the grips of slavery in Virginia. And the only reason you know me as the accomplished man I am today is because I took my destiny into my own hands. And like so many others like me who understood that the Civil War was a freedom struggle, I escaped. And unfortunately, I was captured right outside of Columbus. And since I refuse to acknowledge that any slaveholder owns me, Mississippi laws of 1863 required that I be sold back into slavery. I was dragged to auction and sold to a man by the name of John Miller, whom I worked for until federal troops arrived and set me and the vast majority of this county free. And once free, I immediately set to work on starting my own business and helping throughout my community. In 1867, the military governor appointed me to the Columbus City Council. Now, I was the first, and for a while, only African American holding such a high position at that time. And after that, in 1870, I was elected to the Mississippi State Senate. And I remained the only black man to represent all of Lowndes County in the Mississippi Senate. And meanwhile, my businesses in Columbus were thriving. Now, you may have heard of Leeds Corner. My store was right across the corner from the Lowndes County Courthouse. And at that time, I owned 295 acres of farmland, three city lots, 
a general store, and a comfortable family home. Now, I stood in this community as a leader and as an example to follow. And while I'm speaking about my family, I was blessed with a hardworking wife, Susan, three sons, and a lovely daughter, Anna Louise. But things weren't always easy for my family. My success, it brought tension and violence upon my household. Most local whites couldn't conceive of freedmen as their equal. And when I ran for sheriff of Lambs County in 1875, jealous white men invaded my home, shot into my furniture, and shredded Susan's clothes. Fortunately, my family was able to escape to the safety of the woods. And on that same night, the night of November 2nd, 1875, I was leading the voter parade throughout Columbus. Today, you might call it a get out the vote rally. And as we moved through downtown, a mob led by Jacob Hunter Sharp attacked us. They shot into our group, killing four innocent black men and wounding three others. And I owe my life to a friend that hit me in his well that night. The next day, hardly any of my people voted for fear of their lives. The dream of freed men and freed women being fully accepted as citizens seemed dead after that night. And I testified to those events before Congress, but there was no federal help that would come to restore the protections of the Constitution upon me or my people. Neither President Grant nor Congress were willing to protect black citizens from violence and terror. And convinced that neither Columbus nor the rest of Mississippi was safe for me or my family, we moved to Galveston, Texas. And after we fled, my, my property and businesses were seized by local white men, and I had no recourse to preserve either. <laughs> now, I wasn't surprised by the white man's actions, but my family and I suffered nonetheless. But like so many others at that time, we persevered. I guess you could say we, we made a way out of no way. My daughter, Anna, became a teacher in Columbus and then in Texas. And my son, John Roberts, became politically active in New York. And as for me, I continued to fight for the advancement of my people after moving to Texas. I spoke widely to churches and civic groups about black business and political participation. And I even had the honor of speaking at the Texas State Convention. And then I died in July of 1916, and I was buried back in Columbus. Now, while my time on this earth ended over a century ago, seeing all of you here tells me I didn't struggle for nothing. You know, I used to tell my children that we all stand on the shoulders of someone who came before us. We had our setbacks as a people and as a country in my day, but it's clear that progress has been made. And I like to think that you folks can reach higher, even when times are tough, because those many years ago, I stood tall and offered my shoulders for you to stand on. And I hope that you can do the same for those who come after you. Darian's our last performer, and perhaps you can see why. <laughs> the, uh, the story of Robert Gleed is one that reveals, uh, as I said, this hopeful expectation, and then uh, the story of promise is not kept, essentially. At the end of Reconstruction, as Darian said, he is uh, chased out of office uh, before the 1875 election as were many African-American leaders throughout the state of Mississippi, a state which students uncover, and I'll remind you, was majority African-American until the 1940 census. Uh, this is a very bad copy of uh, the photograph of the state legislature composite blown up, but that's the best image I have of Robert Glee. Uh, this is the grave site of his daughter, Anna Louise Glee. Uh, Senator Gleed is buried in the same plot, and it's the only plot in Sandfield Cemetery that's really marked off with anything. There's a chain link fence around it, which suggests back in the 50s or 60s, somebody recognized that this was a, a pretty important person, and indeed it was. Um, when Senator Gleed died in 1916, um, the local newspaper reported his death, and the last sentence says, Gleed was the last remaining colored man to hold a seat in Lowndes County now held by an honorable white man. So, you know, that says it all in a lot of ways on his death in 1916. His store would have been, this is the Lowndes County Courthouse. 
and uh, this would be Second Avenue North, and his store would be off screen, kind of in this area on the corner, a cat corner to the courthouse, southwest of the courthouse. But it's not just those folks buried in Sandfield Cemetery, and I'm going to quickly give you a, a rundown of a few. Simon Mitchell Sr. was the first Justice of the Peace, African American Justice of the Peace. He also was the uh, president of the Deacon Board for Missionary Union Baptist Church. William Isaac Mitchell was his son, who was the first African-American principal of Union Academy, which came out of the Freedmen's Bureau School in Columbus, which means that Union Academy could make the case as one of the first public schools for African-Americans in the state. Uh, Benjamin Fernandez, this is a photograph of W.I. Mitchell, a historic marker in the school named after him. This is the uh, W.I. Mitchell, who is the president of the Board of Trustees of the Penny Savings Bank, uh, on the only, to my knowledge, solely owned and operated African-American bank in Columbus, which operated from 1907 to about 1914. Um, over here, other leaders include, this is Dr. T.V. James, Theodric V. James, a graduate of Meharry Medical College, who's the first African-American doctor in Columbus. Uh, this is the Union Academy. The original Union Academy was on that spot where the state historic marker was that I started off the program with. In 1902, a new building was built at this location, which is on North Side on 7th Avenue North in Columbus, excuse me, 6th Avenue North in Columbus for Union Academy. And this building was replaced in the 1960s by the current Union Academy building. You can't see this. This is a tintype, though, of Benjamin Fernandez and his wife, Emma. Benjamin Fernandez was on the school board in Columbus during Reconstruction. His wife, Emma, was Alan Rabb's sister. This is the gravesite of Richard Denthrif Littlejohn. Littlejohn was a graduate of Oberlin College, and he came to Columbus and was a newspaper publisher. When I first went out to the Sandfield Cemetery in 1998 to begin to put together information about it, I was walking through this you know, desolate cemetery. I'd like to say I had more hair than I do, but I didn't. And, uh, and I had my clipboard. And I'm walking through a predominantly African-American neighborhood, and it's pretty rough. There is a well-beaten path, though, through this particular cemetery. It went from a little one stop to the community nearby, and the most often trod part of that included somebody holding some kind of alcoholic beverage. And I was walking through the cemetery, nerdy history teacher, looking down at gravestones, and this guy comes up to me, you know, carrying his frosty beverage, and he says, basically, what are you doing? Uh, and I said, well, I'm explaining, I'm trying to develop a project to learn about the cemetery. Do you know anybody buried out here? Do you know anything about them? And he said, I don't, but I can tell you one thing, that dude over there, he was heavy. And that's this dude, <laughs> Richard Denther for Little John. To give you a sense of scale, this plinth is about eight feet high. Behind it is an obelisk that was knocked down by a tornado in the early 1990s. It's about another six feet. And then this urn would have gone on top of the obelisk. So this entire tombstone, if it were to be reconstructed, would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 feet. He was pretty heavy. Now, this allows us to talk about other leaders in Columbus that are not buried in the Sandfield Cemetery. Uh, one is Emmett J. Stringer. You guys don't know about Emmett J. J. Stringer. Well, maybe some of you do. Emmett J. Stringer, uh, but you've heard of a guy named Edgar Evers. Emmett J. Stringer was the state president of the NAACP. According to Merle Evers, it was Emmett J. Stringer in Columbus who asked Medgar Evers at their home, at the Stringer home, to become the state field secretary of the NAACP. So Emmett Stringer was a dentist in Columbus. He organized local NAACP. He uh, pushed for, he was a native of Mount Bayou. I think he knew uh, Medgar Evers from his time selling insurance in Mount Bayou. But in any case, Dr. Stringer, uh, story we can approach by talking about GLEED and leadership in the 19th century, and then let's talk about it in the 20th century as well with students. Now, finally, the program. I mentioned that young lady, Renita Holmes. This is Renita at the first tail, uh, excuse me, first 8th of May program in 2006. This is the crowd in 2006. We did two performances, one at 5.30 and one at 6.30. I can tell you right now, I think I exaggerated a little bit and I reported that we had 35 people at 5.30 and maybe 12 at 6.30. This is that same performance, and you can see that. I'm, I'm definitely taking the angles to try and inflate the size of that crowd. 
this is 2015. In 2015, the 150th anniversary of uh, the 8th of May, we had 300 people in the cemetery. Um, these are images from that year. Whoops. Sorry. And this was last year. We had about 200, 250, and we've got a stage now. The city's on board. It's been pretty great. We've also got national attention. The Atlantic has reported on this particular program, as has U.S. News and World Report, which I mistakenly called U.S. World and News Report last week. Somebody corrected me. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not perfect. And just as my wife. And most importantly, we now have a new state historic marker. So where we began in 2006, the only story, uh, official version of the story of Columbus and Lowndes County, um, those state historic markers are one really great way to think about how people learn about what's significant in their community. The only mention is really an afterthought, that Union Academy portion of a CSA marker, Confederate States marker. This is the new state historic marker in, at the corner of the Sandfield Cemetery, uh, which has been placed there with the efforts of the Galaxy Garden Club, which is, um, I'm going to quote a student, isn't that a bunch of older white ladies? Absolutely is. Uh, this is the landscaping early in its stage, and we'll be dedicating that marker at 5.30 a week from this evening on the 8th of May in Sandfield Cemetery, followed by the dramatic musical performance of students from the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science and... This year, four, uh, Ann Webster will like this, four students in the United Harmonies Choir from the Mississippi University for Women. Questions? That's all I got. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? If you do, if you just raise your hand and, and Chris will bring you the microphone. Or you can shout it out and I'll repeat it. Yeah, but we'll get it on the video this way. Oh, I'm sorry. Darian is from Bahalia, Mississippi, which he just recently learned is noteworthy. Why? Somebody died there. William Faulkner died in Bahalia. Yeah. So a lot of folks don't realize that. Um, so I know that the students do their research in archives, and I'm wondering um, whether there's any difference in the sources that are available for the African Americans in Sandfield than the whites who are buried in the other cemetery. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, Stuart, the, um, when I arrived in Columbus, Tales from the Crypt was well established, and that was Carl Butler's project. I arrived having just completed a master's degree at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at Ole Miss, and my master's thesis was about African American culture and empowerment in rural southwest Georgia. I said, man, we need to do a cemetery project like Tales from the Crypt in Sandfield Cemetery. I spent a year looking into the resources available, and essentially I found that there were not enough resources available to unleash an entire class of students on individuals buried in Sandfield Cemetery. And I would still argue that's not the case. The difference now is, what I, what I do is, I'll have groups of students in my African-American history class, either two or three, and they're researching small groups of people. So, for example, um, it's not just Alan Rabb, but the entire Rabb family with a focus on some member to try and uncover more about them. This year, nobody selected the Gleed family, so I took that upon myself. And, uh, and John Robert Gleed, who is Robert Gleed's oldest son, interestingly, ends up uh, running a mining company in Mexico City, and then he dies in New York and dies of per pericarditis. Any physicians in the room? Good. I'm going to make it up. No, it's, it's, it's some kind of heart inflammation of the heart or something like that. He died of a heart disease at Mount Sinai Hospital right next to Central Park and owned a house in Harlem. Uh, John Robert Gleed was the only African-American delegate from the state of New York to the Progressive Party con National Convention in 1912, Teddy Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party Convention. So, you know, it's, it, but, but I can access that through online resources now. We have an Ancestry Classroom account. If any of you are teachers, you can apply to Ancestry. They'll give you a free for a year account to Ancestry, and we, uh, uh, yeah, we utilize that. But, the, yeah, the wealth of resources definitely lacking in African-American research. I think I think the um, the performance is very good. Thank you. Excellent um, 
current history, or living history, whatever you want to call it, but it just bring history to life. That's very good. Um, I was just wondering, um, why, what about the possibilities of having to make it more balanced? Maybe you'd have one or two young ladies. You have to fo well, we they were successful ladies yeah. as well, women who were successful at the same time that, that we're talking about. So maybe you might have, might be, think of one or two females to represent women who were successful at the time as well. Absolutely, and, and we do secondly, in performance. Just, just one other thing. <laughs> just like one other thing. Sure. Um, the other thing is, um, to what extent was um, the Freedmen's Bureau successful in Mississippi? Do you have any idea? Well, I'm not the expert on that. I can tell you the Freedmen's Bureau schools in Columbus had the second largest enrollment in the state. Vicksburg had the highest enrollment. And one of the points that Darian makes in his performance is essentially um, quoted from a Freedmen's Bureau officer in Vicksburg in his report, uh, Colonel Thomas, if I recall his name, uh, he says that generally whites cannot conceive of the freedmen and women as their equals. They can't conceive of them as anything other than property. And, uh, and so that's, we, the Freedmen's Bureau has limited success in the state of Mississippi is what I would suggest. Now, as far as women, you're correct. Uh, we have seven performances this year, and of those performances, half are females. They're just not the ones that are here today. So I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, for various reasons. And we also don't just do historic drama. Um, students, I, I ask students, do you have some original poetry that you think speaks to the issues that are central to this pr presentation? This year, Kiara Monroe, who's from Ruleville, and Jessica Morton. Where's Jessica from, Ezra? She's also from Ruleville. We've got the Ruleville trifecta. Um, two students are doing original poetry, and then another student who is from Clinton is doing um, Natasha Trethaway's Native Guard, which is inspired by African-American Union troops on the Gulf Coast. Are there other questions? Awesome performance. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the students, based upon the environment in which we are living in America today, and based upon your studies uh, that you have accomplished, how have these studies helped you to form opinions and formulate uh, maybe some solutions to problems today? <laughs> Darren, why don't you take it? Okay. That was heavy. Okay. Um, stand, stand up. Okay. Okay. Stand, yes, sir. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> um, so, I guess I would say, like, Robert Glead's story is really inspiring, I guess, obviously. But, I don't know, he was in a really hard time, if you will. And he was able to acquire a lot of success despite setbacks. And I guess it makes me more inclined not to give up on myself um, because I know for a fact my life was not as hard as his. And I feel like it's really inspiring. It's like he really cared and he was really passionate about it, so he did it. And um, that's a really beautiful thing. And I think it's really useful now. I think the idea of being able to progress and understand how to get out of certain situations and how to combat what you're in is really important. Um, so you avoid stagnation and things of that sort. That is my two cents. Um, so I'd like to say, just with the, uh, the events being the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration and by extension Tales from the Crypt, has humanized a lot of our subjects, much more than just reading about them in, a, um, like in, in, in any archives would ever do. Um, because... Like for instance, my I performed as uh, J. G. Parsons, who was like a, a ex Confederate soldier, um, for Tales from the Crypt, and hearing like reading his story and then portraying that has helped and uh, so many people like understand kind of his mindset, like the stuff he went through, and I and same goes for Eighth of May, like having these students develop their own performances and try and look into them and see what were their motives, what why did they do what they did. Um, 
and like I said before, it just humanizes them and for, it's helped me a lot like seeing these other performances really open my mind when I'm looking back into history now when I because now instead of just reading the words on the page and thinking, oh, that's why it happened and going on with my day, I can actually, you know, picture what it was like and it has definitely at least helped me and I hope it's helped everyone here and everyone that has been to these events actually change the way they think about now and if not humanizing the people that they've been watching on stage, humanizing the people around them as well. And I'm not sure. Oh, go ahead, Ezra. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I feel like the knowledge that we have learned now today just contributes to how we can improve upon not only American society, but also the world as a whole. Because portraying Alan Rao really just shows me how hard work pays off, that despite the discrimination and hatred that he, and that he had to endure despite his years, it shows that it's just a testament of how that you can just let your character, let your light shine to people and just change, change people. Sometimes your actions speak a lot louder than your words. That's a, that's a lot. That's something that I had to learn through here and also portraying Jesse Freeman Bowman at Missionary Union Baptist Church and the commonality between Robert Glee, Cyrus Green, Alan Rav, and Jesse Freeman Bowman is that they all they put their heart and soul into something that they so strongly believe in and that people can change. And change doesn't start unless you change yourself. Then you'll be able to change other people because you have to take it one day, one inch, one feet, one, one foot, all one moment at a time. And just progress, it just starts. It won't happen just exponentially or quickly. It'll just, it'll take time. Just just let it happen. Just keep doing what you're doing and allow your light to shine because somebody is going to notice and somebody is going to bring that story into existence just like we do with the 8th of May. And that is why we do this. And this is why we perform. And I believe we're out of time, but I, I would add on just slightly. Um, and that is... What works about this project in our community, and you heard it from all three of these guys, drama when it works. And, and, and by the way, I'm not a drama person, okay? Um, I'm rarely accused of even being dramatic. But the, the fact is that drama when it works forces people to think. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton reminds us that when men and women start to think, the first steps in progress are taken. And I think you see that with their testimony. I think some of you are probably thinking right now. And I can assure you that in our Tales from the Crypt performances, as well as the 8th of May performances, each year we have about 2,000 people in a cemetery thinking. And, uh, and I, I like that. Okay. Did we have another question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've, we've met before, Chuck, and right. we've... Um, the, the staff at the Civil Rights Museum have met with you and what you said earlier about how you started, when you started doing this, you noticed that uh, people were just walking through the cemetery and not really like paying it any mind and it was history all around them and they were just like not really knowing what it was and we even talked to another person when we were down in Columbus with you and they thought they played baseball and stuff in the cemetery. Uh, so thank you for doing this to not only um, educate people in Columbus about what the cemetery is, but also including young men and women in this program to educate them to keep that going. But also, what are other programs uh, going on in Columbus that is uh, hearkening back to the, the history of old, to its past, to its rich history, that is bringing things like the Sandfield Cemetery and things during Reconstruction to life besides just Tales from the Crypt and the 8th of May celebration? Uh, that's a great question. We have the Hunt Museum, which was just recently uh, severely damaged in the tornado that hit Columbus that a lot of you guys are aware of. Their, uh, their collection was heavily damaged. Much of it is stored now at the Columbus Lowndes County Library and I think also at the Mississippi University for Women, the W, as we call it, lovingly in Columbus, in the archive special collections there. You know, Columbus is a really fascinating place. It's a white planter town 
which benefited uh, economically, politically, from the institution of slavery, and then the continuation, the aftermath of slavery, control of labor of the African-American community, which, again, majority of Columbus and Lowndes County, uh, really until just recent years, the majority of Lowndes County. We're still making progress there, I guess is ultimately the answer. I'd like to say that every day of the week there's something really cool happening for racial reconciliation and dealing with history and exploring new avenues of history, but you know I, that would not be accurate. We're making progress, and we're making that progress one day at a time with well-meaning people who are willing to engage in a conversation. I, as I started off, I think I said, uh, we've got to be able to engage in an honest conversation about our history because it's our history. And the only way we can really work together moving forward is by being willing to sit down and talk to one another. Um, and I hope that, you know, this... Uh, which, by the way, is amazingly transportable. You can do this anywhere. Because remember, the burial ground is common ground. But I hope that you also will engage in these kind of conversations in whatever community you're in. And, um, and thank you for having us. Thank you all for coming today. There are schedules of upcoming programs as well as a list where you can sign up and we'll send you an email each week reminding you of what's going on. I hope that we see you back here on Wednesday of next week for Natalie and Jim Adams talking about their new book. Help me thank once more these three young men, Chuck Yarbrough, for this program today. <laughs>